and welcome to Round Robin. I'm your host, Robin McCormick, with the City of Hampton's Communications Department. And we're going to talk about a national convention that's coming to Hampton that is maybe a little more fun than some of the other conventions and gives you an opportunity to go see some performances. My guest is Dylan Pritchett. Welcome. Thank you. So tell us, you've been involved in the National Association of Black Storytellers for quite some time. Long time. Long time. I think my first festival was in 86, 1986. And... Uh, and it began in 1983, so I caught the third in Chicago is where we were. And I haven't missed but maybe two or three cents. And that would make sense that right in the 80s was sort of, um, you're, you're trying to preserve and revive mm. this form of culture that was, you know, probably uh, not encouraged for a while there. <laughs> well, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. People say that uh, storytelling uh, at one point was being revitalized and it never went away. It never went away. It's just that there, there becomes lapses in people use, using storytelling and how it's used in educational systems and in festivals and that sort of thing. So it never really went away. It was just a resurgence, I guess is, is, is a good word. Uh, but the National Association of Black Storytellers uh, began in 1983 by two of our co-founders, um, one named uh, Mary Carter Smith from Baltimore and the other was Linda Goss from Philadelphia. And they were at a storytelling festival and kind of looked around and said, wow, there are only two or three African-Americans that are being featured here. And then the next year they said, wow, there are only two or three African-Americans that are being featured Probably here. Probably the same two or yeah, three. Yeah. Right, right. And so they said, well, we tell stories. So the whole idea was to develop a, an organization to give an opportunity to those uh, who are storytellers. And when the first one was held in 1983, people came from everywhere. And that's when everyone kind of looked around and said, wow, there's a group of people that do what I do. And, um, and black storytelling is simply telling the story of those from the African diaspora. So there's Jamaican tellers and Brazilian tellers and, and, uh, and Br'er Rabbit stories, and Nancy stories from Africa. And so it's, uh, our, our organization has become a family reunion where everybody comes to share with each other, not only stories, but also to come up with ideas of how we uh, go into the communities and give the communities what they need. Uh, some kind of uplift, uplifting stories, but also uh, bring out some of the history uh, that's not only in the cities that, that we're, we live in and that we visit, but also those people that normally don't get talked about. Grandma and Auntie and Uncle Joe, you know, because uh, they're heroes too. And we have to celebrate their story, but we have to first tell their story. And, uh, so that other people will know. And the more, the more you tell stories about family, about community, about state and local, regional, then the more you see the commonality, not only amongst African Americans, but, but the community as a, as a large. So uh, we don't, we don't um, discriminate against any culture or, or um, any group, um, but we, we stick to that African oral tradition, which is to educate through stories. So we're entertaining big time. Uh, we, have, we have a ball. There's a lot of dancing, a lot of hugging, <laughs> and a lot, of, uh, a lot of sharing that happens at our festival and conferences. Well, is, is storytelling a little bit inherently different when it comes from the African tradition than some other cultures, for example? Or is there a real commonality in before written word or before people were truly, most people, mm. able to write and read mm. that storytelling was kind of universal? Yeah, well, uh, I, th <laughs> I, I, think, I think all cultures have storytelling. Um, and, and some might not call it storytelling. They might call it narrative or what have you. But... It is within the African oral tradition that there, in Africa, for example, there was a person called a Jalia, or a Jali, and which later is called a Griot, uh, which is the French word for all of that. Okay, and Griot, so, I've heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the Griot's job was to educate through story. So it's the extra element of the Griot being able to tell stories that can help solve um, problems of the day. And so, uh, for example, the Griot in Africa would show up when people would have children, um, when people would die, they would come and tell their story at, at their funeral, or they would give suggestions of names of that person because they would know the history of that family and where that family fits into the whole, uh, in, into that community. And so it was, the griot is an added kind of, of um, what's the word, a figure, um, but it was the use of stories in the evening. As you were saying, you know, you might not have a television or radio throughout history in, you know, in families and communities, but 
that griot was always consistent and people knew that when the jali or the griot was telling the story that you'd listen. So it's, uh, I, I always say that storytelling is not the art, just the art of telling, it's the art of listening. And we need to learn to listen. And listening means we stand still, we understand, and then we can process. And our children today need to learn to process, but you can't process if you didn't hear. So it's listening, processing, and then discussion. And uh, that is, is, is uh, the, the, the black storytelling in a nutshell is to uh, tell stories that are entertaining, but at the same time later on you think about it, you say, wow, that meant so and so. And then someone else can say, yeah, but you know, he, he or she said such and such a phrase and that would twist the story. So it's all in listening and taking those lessons away. Now, storytelling, a lot of adults think about storytelling only mm. for kids. That mm. They, mm. they forget that this is an art form that can also reach adults. And oh, as you yeah. said, kids are having a hard time with it because it's not uh, electronic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and we get away from, uh, we kind of get away from how, how to include children in such a setting. See, when, when the stories are told, the children hear the same words the adults hear. But it is in the discussion that the children kind of look around and they hear how their aunt heard that story and then how their uncle heard that story and then they speak and uh, but but their thoughts are just as valid as everyone else's but they understand the thought process and how how um, as you get more mature that your thoughts might change but it is valuable for the adults to hear what the children say to hear what words they heard because then in the retelling of that story Maybe you want to not use that word because that threw them off, that kind of thing. So it's listening not only for the children, but adults. But storytelling uh, is an adult art that you have to do for children, you know. So mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you, you, you appease the children and the children hear it more. But there's nothing like an adult audience, nothing like it. Now, this year's festival, our, our um, theme is connecting with our youth. Um, many, many stories, uh, one voice, many stories. So we're trying to connect with the youth to, to have them included in our, in our festival and conference as much as possible and, and to have their voice be heard and for them to listen to us as well. So uh, we have a, a lot of events for, for the youth and by youth I'm speaking of from school age all the way to 30. Because it's ah. still young adults. Oh yeah, young adults need it too. Uh, because that's a, that's a very vital age group to reach catch them young and catch them when they're having children, you know, family oriented right, right. so that so that that art can continue into the the um, and, you know, when they become elders, they would have that background knowledge of the value of storytelling. So this national convention, how many people do you think um, will be in Hampton for the for this mm. week for the duration? It's always hard to say. I know. Um, <clears throat> always between 250 to 300. Uh, that come from our 14 affiliates, and we have 14 affiliates throughout the country. And uh, the, the difference in this storytelling festival, as in many, as in others, uh, would be that these are people that are really out in the field. These are professional uh, storytellers who might go to over 100 venues a, a year, and we all come together at one place. And while we're at that place, even the community has an opportunity uh, through our Adopt a Teller program to have one of these tellers go into their schools. And, wow. and it's, oh, it's, it's, it's a bargain because you don't have to pay for transportation. They're here. Oh, they're here, they're right at the, uh, the Crown Plaza. And so you just go pick them up, take them to your venue, bring them back. And it's a, it's a very popular program. When we were in New Orleans, we went to 72 different places during that week. And last year we were in Baltimore, we went to every library in, that, in, that, uh, in the city. And you're coming to our Hampton and Library. We're to Hampton. I, I saw that. Yeah. We'll make sure to post that yeah. up so people can can know and can attend. And that's what's different. I mean, a lot of times when people have a professional convention, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's accountants and they learn from each other, and it's a wonderful thing for them, but it doesn't affect the community. Yeah. Whereas yeah. you guys, yeah. it's a it's a <coughs> treasure trove. Yeah for yeah. Hampton residents and residents of the, of the greater right, area right. to be able to hear an amazing array yeah, of performances. Yeah. And, and, the, and, and that's very important to us. Uh, for example, we always begin our, um, our festival and conference with uh, a black history tour of the city that we go to. And so, okay, and let's put in a plug for Hampton because if you, if you are going to a place where you're looking for African-American history, 
Hampton, Hampton really is a great place to start. It is. It really is. It really is. Um, and, and we're going to go to the Hampton History Museum. We're going to go to Port Comfort or um, Fort Monroe. We right. have to Freedom's go there. Freedom's Fortress, absolutely. We have to go there. It's where the Africans first came in and exactly. where, where freedom began, exactly. really. Exactly. And, and we're going to the Hampton uh, University Library because uh, we, want to, we want these folks from throughout the country to see John Bigger's murals right there. Oh my gosh, the and that museum yeah. is amazing. Yeah. And we also want to pay our respect at their cemetery, where they oh, not only nice. have um, the founder of Hampton University and those who uh, matriculated there, but also uh, the Native Americans that were there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we want to go and pay homage to them because a lot of African American history is connected with um, Native Americans. And so we want to go and pay our respect um, there at the cemetery. And then that night, Wednesday night, there's a free public uh, concert um, that Marie St. Clair is putting together for us, and she's been, she's been a gem. She's amazing. Yeah, she is, she is, and she's an excellent playwright as well. So mm -hmm. I would urge anyone in Hampton that, that has an opportunity to go to see, one, see her play uh, whenever it, and wherever it would be. But uh, Marie St. Clair is putting together the pre-festival event, which is Hampton's way of welcoming our organization to the city. So uh, she's putting together an array of talent from Hampton. And there may be dancers, or storytellers, spoken word folks, and uh, drummers, who, who, whoever she can assemble. And they will, uh, they will perform for us. And that's from 7 to 9 o'clock at the Crown Plaza, Wednesday, uh, the 6th of November. And so just a couple of days from now. That's right. And, and so uh, they can just come on down. Like I said, it's free. And see their own local performers uh, that they may not have even seen. And so uh, that's always a wonderfully... Uh, what's the word? Uh, it's, it's really charged because, and, and, and it's, it's a way for Hampton to put their, their foot in the ring. Mm -hmm, and so, mm -hmm. and for these storytellers that come from Minneapolis, Detroit, Cleveland, San Diego, Philadelphia, Providence, Rhode Island, Rochester, New York, New York City, Raleigh, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, you know, and Minneapolis. Uh, I, know, I know I've missed some, but that's okay. They're 14. Right. And, and they, they um, this being only the second time we've been to Virginia, uh, we were in Richmond in the year 2000, but um, Hampton uh, gives us an opportunity to put Virginia forward. And being a Virginian, being a Virginian, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm proud to have the organization finally come to the Hampton Roads area and specifically Hampton because a lot of my family is in Hampton. And so uh, it's going to be a great time on Wednesday. Yeah. And yeah. all week. So there's opportunities for people. And we'll post this and post the website where people can come to a performance or more than mm -hmm. one. And you said there's discount rates for oh, teachers yes. and yeah. all kinds of opportunities, yeah. students, people who, um, who might want to come take advantage. As you said, these people are in dozens of cities across the country, mm -hmm. what you would have to pay mm -hmm. to travel and see these performances. And they get to be here. Exactly. And, and every night uh, there's a concert. Uh, there's the end of, uh, Thursday night is our grand opening, which is going to be at Ogden Hall on the campus of Hampton that's University. That's pretty hall. And um, that's our opening gala. That's the true official opening of our festival and conference. And that would be an excellent event. Um, it's being sponsored by the uh, Office of Student Activities. Uh, and they were so gracious to, to sponsor us. And uh, what we're going to do is have eight of the nine featured tellers tell during that night. So it's a good opportunity for the community to come out and see who these tellers are that will be featured in the concerts on, uh, on Friday night, which is the end of, in the tradition concert. Uh, Sonia Sanchez will be the very first person on there. And that concert is dedicated to, to do traditional, uh, to traditional stories and traditional um, oral types of things, uh, types of art. Uh, so it could be a spoken word artist, it could be a poet. But Sonia Sanchez is our gem, and we love her, and she loves us, and she always wants to participate, and she fits the end of the tradition, that's, uh, uh, which features the type of stories that we never want to forget. Then on Friday night, um, I'm sorry, on Saturday, we have the Zora Neale Hurston concert, which will be at the Crown Plaza. And Zora Neale Hurston is one of our, uh, one of our gems, too. Wow, um, yeah. And so uh, that is a very, uh, very respectful type of, um, well, all of them are, uh, very uh, respectful 
concert that, that really features some wonderful tellers. And then we finish with Sunday morning at a, a Linda Goss breakfast, spiritual breakfast, which we tell spiritual stories. And it's just like going to church. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But every night we have concerts. Uh, you can buy tickets at the door, $5 for children, uh, for regardless of the concert. And I cannot forget Saturday, because Saturday afternoon at one o'clock is the youth concert, which would be the youth telling stories. After that is the Youth Liars Contest. <laughs> oh, that so, sounds fun. Yeah, this is when they get awarded for actually telling a lie. That's <laughs> and great. And then after that is the Adult Liars Contest. And we have an Aesop's Cup, which is a big silver bowl, uh, which goes to the winner. And then, um, and, and those events are things that, uh, or, or concerts and events that we just, uh, we can't get rid of ever well, because that's, that's oh wonderful. oh that's the fun. So. Now I don't want to cut you off, sure. but I want to make sure that you get a chance to give us a little sample. And I realize you can't perform during this this yeah. festival because yeah. you're too busy running the show, exactly. and that that would be a conflict. But since you're here, if you don't mind uh, giving us a short story sure. and and letting us know what that experience is sure. like, maybe that'll motivate people to show All up. All right. Okay. Well, sure. we're going to break for a minute and then come back uh, with your story. All right. Thank you thank so you. much. Sure. And thank you. I hope to see you at the Storytellers Convention. I remember the moment. I'll never forget that moment. That moment? It was a moment that changed my life. I'd been training with my team for months. And now, we had been called up for the first time. The real deal. Wildfires were getting dangerously close to homes. At that moment, I got my first taste of just how important the Guard is to my community. See how the Guard can be an important part of your life at NationalGuard.com. Okay, when I say to the field, you go Ready? To the field. In the very beginning, the chicken and the cockroach were very good friends. They did everything together. They played together, went to the Hampton Library together, went to the museum together. They did everything together until one day, huh? one day, the chicken, she was asleep. And she heard the rooster crow. <laughs> Miss Chicken, she wake up, she go, oh, it's a fine day. It's a beautiful day. I think I'll go get my friend, Mr. Cockroach. We're going to go to work together. So she headed to the field. Oh, y'all messing up. You got to jump on it now. You ready? To the field. She got to the, to, to the cockroach's house and the door was ajar, so she nudged it open. She hobbled in, looked in the bed, and guess what she see? She hobbled in, looked in the bed, and guess what she see? What did you see? The cockroach fast asleep. So she called him, she said, Mr. Cockroach, Mr. Cockroach, Mr. Cockroach, he opened one eye. The other eye, he goes, oh, Miss Chicken, I cannot go to work with you today. My feet hurt, Ooh, all six of my feet hurt. I cannot go to work with you today. Miss Chicken said, no problem. Some days my little chicken feet hurt too. I'll go work for both of us. I'll get enough food for both of us. You're my friend. Stay in the bed and pull up the covers. He went, shh, and she headed to the field. Dun, 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 